Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 28, Remembering the Freedom Rides, featuring Max Pavisic, a first-hand account of protest and imprisonment. In 1961, bus stations in much of the South were still segregated by race, in spite of a 1960 Supreme Court case that had declared the practice illegal. The Freedom Rides were a campaign in which whites and blacks rode the buses together to defy the Southerners and force them to change. Many activists were beaten by locals, often while law enforcement looked on and did nothing. Many were also arrested. Max Pavisic was a 21-year-old student in Los Angeles when he decided to become a freedom writer. He rode from New Orleans, Louisiana, to Jackson, Mississippi, where he was arrested along with many others, and imprisoned at Parchman Farms. Segregation on the buses was declared illegal in November of that year and ended soon afterwards, in a clear victory for the activists. This was a campaign that worked. I spoke with Max on July 30th, 2020, which happened to be the 59th anniversary of his own arrest. In this episode, he tells his story. Where would you like to begin the story? Well, I think the story begins early in 1917. The Congress, I mean, the... uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation after World War I, a group of pacifists, Christian pacifist labor and uh, peace movements, uh, Quaker pacifists, uh, progressives of various kinds came together and uh, they incorporated the uh, idea of Gandhi uh, of nonviolence. And in 1942, Congress of Racial Equality joined with the Fellowship of uh, Race of uh, Reconciliation, excuse me. And um, anyway, the um, Mississippi. We we went to Mississippi, and but uh, the Freedom Rides started in D.C. And the way, and their original purpose was to take a bus from D.C. to New Orleans. Now, there was a reason for this. Um, There had been a couple of uh, court cases uh, that uh, made it illegal to segregate in public facilities and interstate travel. And um, this was a chance to test that, uh, this uh, Supreme Court ruling. It didn't become law by the Interstate Commission. Uh, until later in uh, November 1961. But anyway, um, we headed for the South, and uh, there was two two buses that left D.C., and they had a uh, last uh, last uh, last dinner in a Chinese restaurant before they got on the buses. And they were heading south. And they didn't have any trouble until they got to Rock Hill, South Carolina. And that's where a group of young thugs uh, interfered with them. And one of them punched John Lewis in the face and broke his nose. So then they got back on the bus, and then they went on, and they went into Anniston, Alabama. And in Anniston... Uh, there was uh, a mob that had been organized by the Ku Klux Klan uh, to meet the bus. And so they kept him on the bus for uh, an hour or two and rocked the bus and swore and did all kinds of things uh, to them uh, when they could through the windows and stuff. Anyway, um, finally they got a um, a driver because the driver of the bus wouldn't go any farther. This is the Greyhound bus. And uh, 
so that it took a while to get a new driver, almost two hours before they could get a new driver on the bus. But as they were leaving the bus station in Aniston, uh, one of the protesters slit the tires in the back. And so when they got a few miles out of town, the tires went flat. And as they were leaving town, there were about there were a whole line of cars following them from this crowd of hecklers. And uh, when they got to uh, out of town, then the people tried to get out of the bus, and because they were already surrounded then by all these hoods that were coming, and uh, they held the door and they wouldn't let the people out. And somebody threw a firebomb into the bus, and they were yelling, kill kill those f***ers, burn them alive. And they were holding the, the front door shut, so people inside could not get out. Well, that uh, firebomb actually exploded the one of the gas tanks in the bus. And that ex- major explosion then, the people that were holding the door It frightened them, and they jumped back, and that's when people were able to get off the bus. And uh, and then they roughed them up uh, when they were on out of the bus and on the ground. There's one guy, Hank Thomas, uh, was one of the first guys out. In fact, he was the first freedom rider out, and sat on the ground, and he was asking for a drink of water. Instead, he got a baseball bat in the head. And so they roughed up. Uh, the crowd and or the freedom riders and the bus burned and that's the famous picture you see of the bus burning in Addison and that picture was transmitted around the world and the next day even in Pravda downtown Moscow was on the front page so here's the land of democracy uh, with this kind of action, and it really embarrassed the uh, <clears throat> Kennedy administration. But anyway, that uh, that was an act that actually made the freedom rights. I think that if they hadn't have done that, and if they could have gone simply through uh, Alabama and Mississippi without too much hassle, uh, it would have been a back page article in the news. But the fact that that brought it to everybody's attention, the world's attention, the nation's attention, uh, then it could not be ignored. Did that happen before you yourself were involved personally? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mississippi was the last group. So this is just the start going into Alabama. Ah, right. And then they, they went into Montgomery, and they got beat up, I mean, really bad. Uh, Bull Connor, the infamous sheriff and uh, racist segregationist in um, uh, Montgomery, gave the crowd 15 minutes to do whatever they wanted to do to the, to the Freedom Riders. So they beat them up with pipes and clubs and everything. I mean, it just uh, went on this... It's just free-for-all beating up these people coming out of the bus. Uh, One guy was permanently uh, paralyzed uh, from that beating. And it was decided uh, that uh, the bus would keep on going, though. The, The trailways bus, and that they were the ones that got beat up real bad first. And then later on, uh, a second bus picked up uh, the people who were on the first Greyhound bus and brought them to the Greyhound station where they were beat up, too. And these people were uh, freedom riders were practicing nonviolence. They believed in direct action, but it was a nonviolent movement. It was based on Gandhi's movement in Africa and Asia. And it was nonviolence is a personal sacrifice. Uh, people uh, have to be willing to face beatings, jail, death. It's a civil disobedience. Uh, 
and it's also set up to put uh, economic pressure on the institutions or the government that they're protesting against. And so uh, it's a tactic. And to some people, it's a social gospel. People like John Lewis was a social gospel, and uh, Martin Luther King. So it was passive resistance in its best. Um, the bus then was uh, continued on into Montgomery, where they were beat up again. Another guy was paralyzed, uh, and they had to fly a couple guys each time to uh, New Orleans to the hospital. The beatings were so bad. But after the first major beating, uh, John Kennedy got very upset. Uh, Kennedy's Kennedy wanted to emphasize uh, foreign affairs, and he needed the senators of the South, who were all Democrats at that time, to support him. So he wasn't a big civil rights advocate because uh, we were upsetting the apple cart. We were agitators, and uh, so it caused some consternation in the uh, in the president's offices, things like this. But they they called, they tried to get it stopped. Uh, they sent a personal uh, envoy, a guy by the name of John uh, Singenfelder, from uh, Kennedy's office to go down and meet with uh, Governor Patterson of Alabama to see if they would call off uh, the thugs and the beatings and stuff like this. Well, eventually he got beat up too and knocked out. Uh, but uh, they sent him down because he was originally from the South, so they thought it would be a good idea. Anyway, the, um, the Freedom Rides were going into Mississippi. Well, wait, would I, let me back up there. Anyway, after those two beatings, in Montgomery and uh, at Addison and uh, the other one. Um, the core called off the freedom rights. They said, people are going to get killed, so we can't go any farther, and we don't want that blood on our hands. So there was a student group in Nashville, and they had organized the original sit-ins lunch counters and stuff in Nashville. So there were uh, four students. Um, John Lewis was one of them. Um, Diane Nash. Uh, let's see who else. Um, James Bevel and C.T. Vivian. And they called the meeting and the students then decided that the freedom rides can't stop. Because if they stop the freedom rides, that means nothing would change in the South. They would continue to be vicious and segregated. So they took uh, a vote and uh, decided to send 10 students from the Nashville uh, South. And they had already uh, organized Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee at that time. And they, they signed their uh, wills and last testaments before they left Nashville. And they took a bus, not necessarily a bus or the train, and got to Nashville and moved down in the station. Well, Bull Connor was waiting for them, collected them all, took them back to the Tennessee line, and then midnight dumped them off on the Tennessee line. And uh, so they couldn't continue on. Well, where he dumped them off was really uh, famous clan territory. But so they didn't know what they were going to do. And they finally found a small uh, farm out of town that uh, two old black people and the wife let the freedom riders in. And then eventually they, various ways, they got back on their own down to uh, Montgomery. So they continued the freedom rides. And the freedom rides then were continued in, uh, and how they continued it, they were 
uh, escorted to the state line by uh, troopers and state police, uh, National Guard and state police. And uh, once they got to the state line, then the Alabama contingent dropped off, but the Mississippi contingent of troopers uh, were waiting for them. Now, Mississippi is an interesting place. First of all, you have to realize that there are only total 436 Freedom Riders. We had a population of 189 million people in the United States. So the Freedom Rides had a major impact on the United States and a major impact in the foundation of the civil rights movement that started in the 60s and is continuing to t- t- until today. And Mississippi at that time was the poorest state in the Union. It still is the poorest state in the Union. Uh, over 80% of the blacks were under the poverty line, the national poverty line, and yet they were the largest population of the state. Uh, but less than 5% of them had the ability to vote at that time when we went in. So I was a student at UCLA, like I said uh, previously, and I was in a summer uh, Spanish class, and I was an uh, anthropology major, and I had uh, planned to go on an archaeological expedition to New Mexico after the course was over. The guy next to me was a graduate student in anthropology, and he said, why don't you go on a freedom ride instead? And I right then, at that time, I decided, I'll do it. Uh, it didn't take an overnight thinking or anything like that. It was like, it's about time I turned my empathy into action. Because a lot of things uh, impact me as I grew up. Uh, the black slums in Chicago when we drove uh, on the L to downtown. Uh, a little book uh, called by the title told me out of the University of North Carolina about a little black boy in rural North Carolina and what he did during the day and how he dressed and stuff like that. And I was living in Southern Illinois at that time and did all the things that he did and dressed the same way and knew that he would be a friend if we were together. So that that had a li- lifetime impact on me. And then uh, I read about the 10th grade, I read the Scottsbury Girl Boys um, saga, which was uh, happened in about 1931 when uh, a group of young black teenagers were accused of raping two girls on a train, two women on a train. It was a total miscarriage of justice, and one guy ended up serving almost 70 years before they let him out. And only recently, in a couple of years, that they, uh, uh, was there a formal apology by the state of Alabama on this. And then Rosa Parks, uh, in 1955, uh, that was an important part of uh, impacting me. Uh, She was not this little old lady, innocent little old lady. She had been trained at Highlander School by Miles Thornton and his uh, faculty in nonviolence actions. And then Emmett Till's assassination or murder in 1959, which shocked the nation and shocked everybody who was around at that time uh, to the core. I mean, he was... 14 years old, he left Chicago to go visit his relatives in um, Mississippi and was accused of whistling at a a lady in the the store in Money, Alabama, in a little grocery store. So that night, her brother and another guy uh, pulled Emmett Till out of his uh, relative's house, took him across the state line into another county into a barn and tortured him all night. They gouged his uh, eye and one of his eyes out and eventually they shot him in in his head and then they took a uh, part of a gin mill fan, big heavy piece of machinery and tied it around him and threw him in the Tallahatchie River uh, to sink to the bottom. Well, he didn't sink to the bottom. He uh, 
he was found the next day by a black man who was there uh, checking his uh, uh, trout line that he had across the, li- the river. And Emmett Till's body was there, but the authorities didn't find him until a day or two later. And they asked this gentleman, how come you didn't report it? And he said, why? He says, I see bodies floating down this river all the time. That's Mississippi. And that was Mississippi in the 1960s. It was considered the most vicious place in the South. It was famous for its lynchings. It was famous for its beatings. Uh, and it was a fascist state. It was completely trolled, controlled. You had the powers to be, and they were controlled top to bottom, and there were the White Citizens Council, Thurgood Marshall, the uh, Supreme Court Justice, called them the Uptown Clan. These are the people who were the politicians, the landowners, uh, the rich people in, in town, I mean, in, in the state. And below that, there was the Sovereignty Commission. They had their own internal FBI. Alabama had this, too. And they went around the state, and they had informants all over the state watching people to make sure that they didn't, quote, get out of line. And so if you got out of line, you could get beat up, you could get lynched, you could be run out of state, and you could lose your house and all kinds of things. And below then the inner in the Sovereignty Commission, the Ku Klux Klan then actually carried out the violence. So, uh, so anyway, the this this state was uh, was a mess. It still is a mess. Their uh, the state pen, the major state pen, they've had uh, from December till March. They had like nineteen killings and suicides in the state penitentiary this year. The, uh, yeah, yeah. And the, um, so anyway, here we, here we go off to Mississippi and, and everybody was afraid of us going into Mississippi because after all of this violence that occurred in Alabama and we're going into the most notoriously vicious state in the Union, uh, nobody knew what was going to happen. But we didn't know, and I didn't know at that time, that Robert Kennedy and Senator Eastland of Mississippi, who was a avid segregationist and racist, racist uh, came to an agreement, which was also agreed with, uh, but with uh, Ross Barnett, who was the... Uh, governor at that time, that we were not to be beat up like the people were beat up and slaughtered in in Alabama. Mississippi was trying to um, basically modernize, to bring some factories down into South. And so uh, the big guys, uh, they didn't want the bad publicity that uh, uh, Alabama had. I mean, Alabama had a tarnished men all over the world after that. And uh, so they they had this agreement that we wouldn't be uh, beaten up. So uh, anyway, I was in class, and I joined this group of people out of, out of Los Angeles. Most of them were UCLA students, 15 of us. And I think they were like... Uh, Twelve of us were students. There were three students from uh, other university. One guy, a postal worker, and I can't remember the last person what they did. And the Corps flew us to New Orleans to get on the um, Illinois Central train. The um, and they flew us because it was at the end of the Freedom Rides. We were the last organized ride from Corps. So we took the train into Jackson, Mississippi. And this, the train is the city of New Orleans, which is kind of ironic because growing up as a kid in my early years in Illinois, I used to ride the city of New Orleans down to southern Illinois to visit my great-grandparents. And it was a tri- childhood dream to drive right on that train to New Orleans. Never would I would have 
thought that I would get on that train going reverse, starting in New Orleans, stopping in Mississippi for a month's vacation, and then go back on the train to Chicago. So it was kind of interesting. But anyway, we were getting off the train, and they obviously knew who we were. Uh, The FBI was there, Mississippi State Commerce Commission. They had a clipboard. Uh, They were marking us off as we got off the train. We go into the waiting room, and the uh, chief of police came up, and uh, we said there was a, a bench in the middle of the waiting room. And there were people that were, uh, it was the white waiting room, and there were people lined up against the wall, regular uh, uh, travelers. And so we had this uh, two-sided bench in the middle of the room, and we sat down on that. Everybody got to sit down except my, there was not not enough room for me. So I had to stand up. So the chief of police comes over and says, uh, you all have to move on. You all have to move on. You're all under arrest in about that time, that, about that timing. So we were marched out uh, it, outside, and the front of the train station was cordoned off by uh, National Guard with uh, bayonets on their rifles, state police, local police and a lot of uh, police dogs, and police dogs in the South were vicious. Uh, they are they were trained by an ex-Nazi living in Missouri. This guy trained dogs for Hitler during World War II to guard the Nazi uh, airfields in Germany. So here he is in the United States training these dogs, or police in the South. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... So they, they anyway, they pushed us into a uh, paddy wagon, and then we went off to jail. Uh, we were booked and then put upstairs in their uh, small jail, in which we were there overnight. Now, there was so many Freedom Riders coming into Mississippi, uh, wave after wave. It start, they started in... Uh, in, I think, July, started coming into Mississippi. Uh, there was no certainly no room in the city jail. It just had a few cells, and there was no room at the county jail because it was filled up with local uh, people that were in for various uh, offenses. And so the state the city rented space at the state penitentiary, Archman Farm uh, State Penitentiary. Now, I said... Mississippi was considered the most vicious place in the South. Well, Parchman Farm had the reputation of being the most vicious prison in the South. And there were stories of people going in and never being heard of again. And the year before we got there, they they eliminated the prison whipper. That's the kind of place it was. And yet it was progressive in some ways but very regressive and antiquated in other ways. Uh, They had uh, what they called uh, guards. That uh, Guards didn't carry guns. They had trustees, which were trusted inmates, carried the guns. Uh, Some of the trustees had businesses inside of the prison. One guy had a cigarette. Uh, business. Other guy had a soda pop business. One guy had a wood shop where a couple guys working in there and they would make souvenirs that were sold in New Orleans. And then they also had conjugal visits for uh, 
the prison guards and some of the trustees and uh, uh, and then if they weren't married uh, they would bring in what they would call jump and Judy's prostitution to anybody who wanted to be served so it was this strange mix of things and yet you know to have to have uh, faith in the prisoners to take care of things and then uh, was really a unique system. It no longer is that way in Mississippi. The guards have to carry the guns now. So anyway, we were put in a small uh, pickup truck with a, a graded back, uh, like a heavy steel wire back and open in, and we're taken uh, up to Parchman uh, State Penitentiary. It was about a two-hour drive. Parchman Farm was a plantation. It was about 22,000 acres, and it was run by prisoners. They planted the crops. They picked the cotton. They cooked the meals, cleaned, cleaned buildings, et cetera, et cetera. And we were first put in a first offenders camp because there was no room in maximum security when we got there because it was filled up with freedom riders. So we were in the uh, first offenders building, which was a new building. It was only about a year old. And it was a nice open air place. We couldn't go near the windows. And we said that if you, they said if you go near the windows, you could be shot. So we didn't go near the windows. We believed them. And we were there about four nights, five nights. And one day we heard uh, hoof prints, you know, stomping and looked out. We could see out the window, we could, and here was a flatbed wagon being drawn by two mules, and they were accompanied by a a uh, guard with a whip and a trustee with a two trustees, one with a rifle and one with a shotgun. And on this flatbed wagon were these black prisoners. They were put in the field to pick cotton. And I thought I was looking at something out of 1830 or something like that. I mean, it was amazing. And then uh, there was a, at one end, there was some vertical bars where the, the night guard watched us in there. And this old man would come in on the, on the later shift, the night shift. And he would come in and he would be so nice and a uh, nice Christian fellow and he just couldn't understand why we would uh, volunteer to come to jail and do this and make all this racket and stuff like that. And then he would turn on the radio, uh, all this uh, Bible banging with Christian preaching, and the guy would actually transform. He would, all of a sudden, he'd be, in an hour later, he'd be standing, holding onto the bars, screaming at us, uh, motherfucking uh, lovers, uh, you know, and I'm like that. I mean, it was just amazing transformation. So anyway, after a few days of that, um, we were taken into the Maximum Security Building. The Maximum Security Building was divided into four parts, and we were divided by white men, black men, white women, black women. At the end of the black women's section, uh, there was the... Um, the the uh, not the gas chamber. I think they put them uh, the uh, electric chair. So, but they didn't do any executions while we were there. So the death chamber was at the end of the uh, women's section. Uh, we walk into the building, and here in front of us were three or four trustees with rifles and shotguns kneeling on the floor with a line of uh, prison guards with billy clubs behind them, and we were told to strip. So there we standing there, stripped, uh, being emasculated in front of all this, all these guns and stuff. Now the women, when they got stripped, some of them were even body searched. But anyway, then they, uh, we had to put our clothes in a like a shopping bag size bag. And then they issued us a pair of boxer shorts that had MSU stamped on the back 
which stood for Maximum Security Unit, and they gave us a, a thin strap T-shirt, and then they marched us off four by four down into our cells. Now, the cells were six by ten. Uh, they were cinder block, and at the one end on the hallway, there were bars. There was no direct light. It had, like, the sunlight up above, across on the wall, so you just you can just only look out at the wall. And there were two, there was bunk beds, and there was a small commode, and there was a small sink. And that was it for two people. Now, it was boring, to say the least. Uh, we weren't allowed any reading material. We weren't allowed TV or radio or anything like that. And we kept the camaraderie by singing. And we sang all these civil rights songs, like We Shall Overcome. And we we would do that for a couple hours of night, every night, and to keep up the camaraderie of the group and stuff. But you really couldn't talk to anybody. You could talk to the people right next to you, kind of around your cell walls and the people next to you. But as far as the whole group, you couldn't talk to anybody. And uh, so this this is what kept us going at that time. Now, some of the black prisoners earlier, the Freedom Riders, uh, they were singing and we were told to shut up and they kept on singing and they finally uh, water hosed them down. And that was early, that was in May, and so it was kind of cool evenings and they took their mattresses away in the Savannah lay on uh, these steel plates on their beds and stuff like that. But I never had to uh, go through any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of problems like that. We we didn't, we didn't, uh, they just kind of left the white men alone. Um, I mean, that's part of the Southern way at that time. Uh, there were a few guys earlier, white guys, that went on a uh, hunger strike, but only a couple that I know of. And then they were put in, in the hole, and the hole was a small uh, four-wall room, which had a little slit under the door, which had the only light in the room, about an inch of uh, height there. And in the hole, in the middle was a hole, about a four- or five-inch hole, and that was the the, uh, the commode. And there was no furniture or anything like that. You sat on the floor in there. And in one time, they took 20-some black prisoners and shoved them in the hole, and it took three people on the outside to push the door shut. There were so many people crammed in there. And when you talk to those guys, some of them said, well, we were in there only 10 minutes. Other guys would say we were in there two hours. You know, the total... Uh, confusion of, and, and panic on some of them. And at that time, I had a little claustrophobia. It would have been tough on me if they would have gone there. But none of that happened to the white men prisoners or the white women or black women prisoners. The uh, Then we there was we got to, out to shower five minutes Every week, four at a time, we're taken down the hall and we showered. And we were shaved. Everybody used the set. They had two razors uh, for four people. And everybody, the whole group, I don't know, there were 20-some of us, had to use those razors time after time. And so they just kind of pull the hair out on your face. But there were no mirrors anyway. So it didn't really care, I guess. You didn't have to care too much. And uh, then we were fed three meals a day. We were, uh, in the morning, we got a uh, meal of grits, uh, wow. chicory coffee, and a biscuit. Now, chicory coffee is typical in the South. It, it, it comes in regular coffee. They even spice it with it. But this stuff made your uh, eyeballs twirl. It was so strong. We're not talking about the chicory coffee you get at the uh, Café Dumont in New Orleans with your big bidets. You're talking about really straight chicory 
coffee. And then at noon and dinner, we got the same meal. We got pork and beans. It was fat back, and you can see some of the hair on the, on the fat back and beans. Um, and with molasses, made with molasses, a piece of cornbread. And uh, my favorite, I'm just being facetious, boiled okra. Boiled okra is like snot. Uh, fried okra, okra in a soup, it's not too bad. But boiled okra, I guess you'd have to be born and raised in the South to appreciate that. And I think two or three days that we were there for 30 days or whatever it was, 30, 31, 32 days, we got a slice of uh, beef steak tomato, we got a slice of tomato. That was a highlight. Uh, during this time, uh, one day uh, when they were passing out the meals, there was a guard and then there was a cart being pushed in front of them. He would walk backwards and hand the trays into slots into the through the bars, into the cells. And there was a black prisoner, a short, skinny guy, always pushing the cart. Well, one day, uh, we were there, it was at noon, and my roommate was laying on the bed with his hands kind of cupped by the bars, and I was standing above him. And that prisoner passed three camel cigarettes and a pack of matches in his hand so quickly the garden didn't see it. Uh, my roommate didn't see it. My cellmate didn't see it. And I only saw it after they were in his hands and I reached down and clapped his hand closed so the garden wouldn't see it. So all of us smoked in those days. And uh, so that was the only smoking we had at that time. So we lit them up and send the cigarettes down from cell to cell. But I'll tell you, a stray camel after being off almost a month off of smoking in a big drag and knocked you right on your ass. So that was the only thrill we had while we were in uh, in jail. The uh, So eventually, uh, we got out. And we got, we were taken back to Jackson. And going into Jackson, we were singing freedom songs again. And the driver, who was a prison guard, kept banging on the back of the cab, yelling, shut up, shut up, shut up. And finally, he pulled over on the side of the road. And the guy came around the back and through that grate uh, that I was talking about earlier. And yelled at us. He says, you know, he says, I told you to shut up. And he says, we're all in trouble. He says, I've been told to drive you guys off into the forest and abandon you in the truck, locked in. He says, I'm going to get in trouble for that, so don't bring attention to us. So, who knows? They could have burned us alive, they could have lynched us if that would have happened. But he was smart enough to be a state employee. He didn't want that blood on his hands. I mean, they knew who who was driving the truck. So then we go into Jackson, and there were local black families that took us in. We showered, we fed uh, fed us, and where where I was staying, uh, the woman said, Medgar Evers is home. So we went across the street and met Medgar Evers. Medgar Evers at that time was the head of the uh, NAACP in uh, Mississippi, and he was a pioneer in trying to get people to vote in Mississippi. The big voting registration didn't start until uh, 1964. Anyway, uh, we were out, and we went and met Medgar in his driveway, and he said, let's go in. It's not safe out here. Thirteen months later, he was assassinated in that driveway. He knew that they were looking for him, and they were waiting for him, and they finally got him. So we go back to... Yeah, I mean, to Chicago, not to Chicago, to Los Angeles. And then we, but we had to come back to Mississippi later in September for our trial. And the trial was, there was a, a jury of 12 white men. 
uh, staring at you, hating you, and you can glitter in their eyes. And uh, we were uh, convicted of being breach of peace. Now, what we were convicted of was breach of peace, which is a misdemeanor. But it's kind of uh, ironic that as a misdemeanor, we ended up in maximum security in the state penitentiary. But uh, anyway, that that's kind of went back to L.A., and then I went on to work in archaeology and things like that. Uh, at that time, we were kind of getting moved out by, by 64. Black power was moving in. There was no really room for white people in the black power movement. Uh, but Vietnam War came along. So a lot of us shifted our attention of uh, demonstrating against the Vietnam War. So anyway, do you have any questions? So you were at Parchman Farms for about a month, you said? Yes. And so they just held you there until they could have a trial for you? Or why well, did they release the, you? Uh, they released us, Core, Core released us. We it, the actual uh, thing was like a two hundred dollar fine and four months imprisonment, but we could get out within thirty days. And so, like I said at the beginning, we were to put pressure on the state and put economic pressure on the state. So Core kept us in there to the maximum, the thirty days, and then they bailed us out. Now a couple people, uh, a couple blacks, served out their whole sentence, but not not the rest of us. Then you went to a trial for this after that, and so you had to go back to jail after that, too? Well, no, we just went to the trial. Uh, we went back to L.A., and then we had to come back to Mississippi for the trial. And uh, we came on the Greyhound bus to Mississippi, and that was a, quite an adventure. There was a black gentleman in Jackson that hosted uh, a friend of mine, Winston Fuller, and I, in a shack, a two-room shack, uh, we stayed, we shared a bed, which was a regular bed, had to leave the lights on because Winston was afraid of the bit bugs crawling up the wall if you turn off the light. And this guy was so thankful for what we were doing. He was, must have been 80 years old at least, poor as a church mouse. So he shared his dinner with us. We each got a slice of white bread, and we shared a can of tuna fish. That was it. That blew me away. It still blows me away when I think about that. That guy yeah. was so thankful. And then we, we went back to L.A. We, after the trial, we flew back uh, to L.A. But that was the first time, uh, besides being in the train station, that I'd been in a waiting room. And in the airport, I walked down the hallway to the bathroom, and I got disoriented, and there was a guy coming down, and I said, which one do I use? And he got all flustered and going on about, you know, you got them, northerners, and stuff like this. Well, there were eight bathroom doors in this hallway. There were uh, white men only, white women only, black men only, black women only, uh, white uh, employees only, men, white employees only, women, white, the black employees, uh, women and black employees, men. I mean, eight doors in wow. this hallway. That's how, how, that's how ridiculous segregation was. And, uh, I mean, it was it was bad in the South. But one of the people, uh, Helen Singleton was in our group, and her husband was the main guy, uh, Robert Singleton, who organized her group. He was a graduate student at UCLA. And uh, she was, they were from Philadelphia, and she used to go down into South Carolina every summer with her family to go visit relatives. There were only two days of the week that blacks could drive on the highway in South Carolina. I've never heard of that. That's amazing. It's hard to believe this stuff, and it's hard to believe how hateful and vicious people were against us. 
And, you know, I was ready for some of it, but I, I, you know, you never, you don't know until you're there what the hell's coming at you. And it was, it was quite a earth shaking and a life changing experience for me, I'll tell you. And it was uh, shortly after that, wasn't it, that the buses and the stations and the waiting rooms did end up being desegregated, isn't it? Yes, yes. And the, the, the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission rule, I think in November of 61, that uh, finally uh, there was some Supreme Court dis decision earlier than a few years earlier that said it was illegal to segregate in public facilities in uh, in terms of transport. But then the order came down uh, and that uh, it was illegal to segregate in bus or train or airport and any facilities there, restaurants, restrooms and stuff like that. So it worked. Yeah, it, de it definitely worked. So looking back at, at the experience that you had then and looking at how things have changed, do you have anything that you would say to people who are the same age now that you were then? Yeah, just keep on fighting. I mean, you have to, even though we have a democracy, you have to maintain your rights. You have to fight for your rights. There's always somebody trying to take them away from you, like uh, the Trump administration, you know, taking away people's voting rights and stuff like this. So there's some always some son of a bitch out there trying to set the clock, turn the clock back. So we have to keep busy, and the young people have to keep busy. My daughters and their husbands, uh, they're adults, but they've been out marching. I haven't been out marching because I have a neuropathy in my feet, and I have to where use a cane when I go outside, and so I can't run. So I, you know, they get charged with tear gas. I'm screwed. So uh, I haven't been able to go. So that's been very frustrating to me. But I am so happy to see how many young people nationwide and the number of young young people that have come out uh, to support changes in uh, the police system in this country. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.